All right, everybody. Hi, I'm Rebecca Lutz of LRT Sports. Well, formerly LRT Sports, we're now two days, and we're delighted to host the Drake webinar series on critical issues on collegiate athletics. Two days is a college athletic website where individuals can come and rate or see ratings on college coaches, athletic staff, facilities, and campus visits. We aim to provide education and transparency about the college recruiting process, health and wellness, and coach and athlete interviews through our blog and webinars. Just some important housekeeping instructions for today. First, in the upper right corner of your Zoom screen, you can choose to view the program in full screen, focusing on the speaker or gallery, which will give you a view of all the panelists. Second, while the first half of the program will be discussion among panelists, in the second half, our panelists will field questions from the audience. Please note the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. This function is now open for you to enter questions. And of course, the moderator will get to the questions and so on subjects that have not been covered during the first half. Third, remember that while a few webinars ever get to all the audience questions because of limited time, one of the best features of the Drake webinar on critical issues in collegiate sports is that following will distribute Q&A with follow-up notes to answer all the attendees' questions that we didn't get to throughout the program. The follow-up notes will also contain a link to the video recording of today's webinar as well as information on the next webinar in the series. Last, if you aren't familiar with the Drake Group or Tua Days, the notes will provide you with links so you can learn more and help support our efforts. And now to introduce the moderator of today's program, please meet Dr. David Ridpath, Associate Professor of Sports Business at Ohio University, College of Business, and past president of the Drake Group. Thanks, Becca. And on behalf of the Drake Group, thanks to all of you attending and joining us today. Unfortunately, we do have to start with some sad news in the world of higher education, college sports, and certainly with regards to the Drake Group. We're saddened to report that Dr. Jerry Gurney, who served the Drake Group as its president from 2014 to 2016, and as a member of its board of directors for 12 years, passed away last night from cancer. Jerry was a professional professor emeritus at the University of Oklahoma, and he educated generations of future athletics managers about critical issues in college sports. As a member of the Drake Group Education Working Committee, he co-authored over 15 major position statements and numerous press statements on current issues in intercollegiate athletics. Jerry was nationally recognized as an expert on NCAA rules and academic metrics. He brought this unique knowledge to the service of the Drake Group and to members of Congress. While representing the Drake Group, he testified before Congress and was instrumental in enabling the construction of federal legislation and igniting congressional pressure to improve health protection and academic outcomes for college athletes. In appreciation and with the greatest respect and thanks, we salute Dr. Gerald Gurney as an extraordinary educator of great personal integrity and whose generous service has brought great distinction to the work and reputation of the Drake Group. We dedicate today's webinar in his memory. And knowing that Jerry would want us to go forward and continue our work, we do go forward today with this webinar. The Drake Group is an academic think tank working to better educate Congress, higher education leaders, and athletic administrators about critical issues in college sports. At its January 2022 convention, NCAA member institutions voted to move away from a national governance model of college sports and begin a transition to rulemaking and enforcement by competitive division. The purpose of today's webinar is to discuss the possibilities and potential of this new economic and governance structure. Will it be capable of solving critical issues of academic integrity, athlete health, safety, and well being, gender inequities, controlling skyrocketing expenditures and salaries? and of course, NILs and recruiting chaos. We thank you all for your attendance today. We have a fantastic panel of experts that will address a myriad of issues regarding the new normal of NCAA governance and the future of college sports in America. A few housekeeping items from me. After I make a short opening statement, I will introduce the panelists and then provide each of them an opportunity to make a brief opening statement specific to their areas of expertise and their overall views on the future of the NCAA. I will then ask panelists if they want to respond to comments from other panelists and then move to the Q&A portion from me and, of course, from you, the audience. We plan on leaving a fair amount of time for Q&A, and we look forward to hearing from you on your questions and concerns regarding college sports. 
So let's get started. Since around 1906, the National Collegiate Athletics Association has been the primary voice and largest national athletics governance association for four-year colleges and universities in the United States. Since the creation of the term student athlete in the 1950s, which by the way, was in response to potential workers' compensation claims by college football players, the NCAA has stubbornly clung to the definition of a student athlete as both a term of endearment but also a term of control. This is evidenced by the governance structure of the NCAA agreed to by its member institutions, which fosters educational attainment and personal development of college athletes, but also suppresses basic rights. Obviously times are changing. Following decades of enormous legal fees and legislative actions challenging rules restraining college athlete employment, along with facing hundreds of concussion related lawsuits and then suffering an adverse US Supreme, uh, US Supreme Court decision this past June in the Alston case, the time for real change is now. The Alston case challenged the NCAA's eligibility system built on control through the use of amateur status regulations, which the organization appeared to freeze based on the fear of future litigation. In essence, the 100 year plus model of NCAA governance is on its last legs. Within six months of the Austin decision, the NCAA convened a constitution committee led by former Texas A&M president and US Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates to reimagine the NCAA. At its January 2022 NCAA convention, member institutions voted to move away from a national governance model of college sports and begin a transition to rulemaking and enforcement by each competitive division. The result will be a much different competitive and regulatory landscape. And even the NCAA is not ready to verify what that landscape may be. Currently, the NCAA has a transformation committee that will examine and make specific recommendations for how this new divisional structure will work. What could be next for college sports in America? For all of us who are committed to continuing the good that college athletics does for athlete personal development and the excitement and pride it brings to campus, local communities, and alumni, there is a need to understand this new economic and governance structure, along with potential recommendations to make it better. Will this new structure be capable of solving many of the issues that will be discussed today, including what we said before, academic integrity, athlete health, safety and well-being, gender inequities, financial challenges, the athletes' rights movement, and other potential harms to participants and higher education. As mentioned, we have a great panel to address these issues and answer questions about where we go from here and the positives and negatives of change. I will first introduce each panelist and then go in reverse order for opening comments. Our first panelist is Marquita Armstead, longtime college athletics administrator and the newly appointed as executive associate AD and senior women's administrator at the University of Nebraska. And I might add a former graduate student of mine at Mississippi State. Marquita has extensive experience in compliance, student services, academics, and NCAA governance at several institutions, including Mississippi State, Tennessee Chattanooga, and the University of South Florida. Our second panelist is a rising star in college athletics administration. Jasmine Ellis is currently the Associate Athletic Director for Student Athlete Academic Services at the University of Akron. Prior to Akron, she was the Associate Athletics Director for Compliance and Senior Women's Administrator at Central State University. And she also worked at St. Mary's University and Cal State San Marcos. Athletically, she played college basketball at Tennessee State. Our next panelist is my good friend, Oliver Luck. A few people have the diversity of experience in sports business as Oliver, including stints as commissioner of the XFL, NFL Europe, as well as general manager and president of the Houston Dynamo of Major League Soccer. From an intercollegiate athletic perspective, Oliver was the former athletic director at his alma mater, West Virginia University, and I might add a pretty good quarterback when he played there. And he also served most recently uh, in college athletics as the vice president of regulatory affairs at the NCAA national office. Some other things he has done, he was a member of the college football playoff committee and most recently consulted with the big 12 conference on their expansion and realignment activities. Next up is fellow Drake Group Board of Director member, Julie Summer. Julie's a Seattle-based attorney. She has wide experience in gender equity, 
Title IX compliance and is recognized as a national expert on name, image, and likeness and different state law laws regarding them. Julie also worked at the Women's Sports Foundation and is a former All-American swimmer and national champion swimmer at the University of Texas. Last but not least is another fellow Drake Group board member, accomplished sports economist, and the Robert A. Woods Professor of Economics at Smith College, Dr. Andy Zimbalist. Andy is widely recognized as the premier expert on financial issues, not only in college athletics, but also in professional sports and other sports segments worldwide. He has dozens upon dozens of peer-reviewed published articles, and as I always say, between Andy and me, we have written around 30 books. The sad part is I've only written two, so it's a pretty amazing body of work that Andy has. And his most recent book, Wither College Sports, published by the Rutgers University Press, is currently out and is a must read for anyone who is interested in college athletics and college athletics reform. Now, without further ado, let's start with Andy, and then we'll go in reverse order to Julie, Oliver, Jasmine, and then Marquita for opening statements. So Andy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dave. College sports was buffeted by a perfect storm in 2021. The tornadoes that hit college sports included the Supreme Court decision in Alston in June that lifted the cap on educational benefits to athletes and raised new questions about the NCAA's amateurism rules. The implementation of the new player transfer portal system. Last year, 1,700 Division I basketball players entered that portal. The advent and then the onslaught of NILs the new NCA constitution, which devolved decision-making and regulatory power to the divisions. The pending FLSA and NLRB cases that attempt to convert student athletes into employees. These storms hit intercollegiate athletics in the middle of a financially crippling pandemic and in an economic environment that even before the pandemic was already acutely unequal and fragile. Among the significant impacts of these developments will be decreasing revenues, as sponsorship payments are, di are diverted from athletic departments to student athletes and increasing costs as athletic departments have to divert resources to NIL support and to a more competitive player market due to the transfer portal. Consider the financial picture within Division I in 2019, the last year of data before the pandemic. There were median athletic department losses of $18.8 .8 million in FPS and 14.3 and $14.4 million losses in FCS and Division I without football. Within FBS, the median athletic department in the Power Five lost $6.97 million, and the median loss in the Group of Five was $23 million. The financial changes of 2021 then will take a precarious situation and make it untenable for most schools, even within the Power Five. This development in turn will create stronger pressures for athletic departments to al align more closely with new revenue opportunities from sports betting, expand the college football playoffs, reduce spending on non-revenue sports and raise student athletic fees. Eventually there will be pressure to reduce coaches compensation, but this will take years to develop. And in the meantime, athletic departments will create larger and larger drains on the educational budgets of their universities. The few athletic departments that are able to withstand the, the challenges of this new financial environment will break further and further away, eschewing longstanding strictures on amateurism and more fully embracing commercialism. This centrifugal force will be even stronger since these departments will now be responsible for their own litigation bills as the new NCA constitution rids itself of these obligations. Where all this ends up will depend in significant part on our fickle court system and our equally fickle and feckless U.S. Congress. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I love the fickle and feckless uh, comments, uh, Andy. Very good. Julie? You're muted, Julie. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Andy. Uh, it seems the, the, the disintegration of the NCAA was visible to everyone, it seems, except the NCAA. In the two years leading up to uh, the Alston Supreme Court case uh, decision and other actions that opened the door to NIO reform, state government, universities, and the private sector prepared for the opening of a true marketplace for college athletes. With the NCAA finally amending their bylaws, not on their terms, but the states and, and the courts that pushed them, we can see uh, one cost of, of rejecting national governance. 
Currently, the lay of the land is we have about 20 states uh, with NIL laws, 13 additional with uh, leg new legislation proposed, at least four that are currently in the amendment process, including Florida, who was the state that originally pushed the July 1st, 2021 effort, effective date, and uh, one uh, law that has been actually repealed in Alabama. Uh, we have three additional with enacted laws and new proposals, and we have uh, 11 other states with legislation proposed in previous sessions but never advanced. And we have only nine now that have no known activity. At the federal level, um, there are active bills in this congressional session, the 117th congressional session. Uh, there were also bills from the prior congressional session. Uh, there are still efforts and intent to establish federal guidelines for NILs, which are much needed, including some with protections for college athletes. My fear is that unless we start to see a concerted federal effort to create a level, level playing field with strong Title IX protections, clarification of potential employer-employee relationships, and a basic set of health and personal welfare protections, the very uneven, often experimental landscape that we see today could potentially create disincentives for strong uniform policies or even lock-in inequities. So that's another cost of the NCA in action. It will take a while for the contours uh, to come into focus. In other words, we've entered a whole new problem space and it will take a while to fully understand what those issues are and what can be done about them. It's not too hard to speculate what the problems might be. For example, the various NIL uh, policies, uh, the sponsorship excesses uh, in bigger schools, high profile sports dominating all else. But I think it's very difficult for the Senate in, the, in Congress to take uh, preemptive action against potential problems, as it was difficult to act leading up to the NIL rights becoming a reality and, uh, and weren't well defined. So, which essentially would have required the Vision One schools to make sacrifices to support general athlete welfare, but there is serious pushback um, on that from some quarters, not all. Uh, with regards to the states and the institutions, as they say that the toothpaste is out of the tube, we have NIL rights, uh, both by state law and the NCA new guidelines. Uh, and as a result, uh, college athletes have these much deserved newfound rights and are doing some, great thing, doing some great things with them and have freedoms that they never had before. We also have a new marketplace where the institutions are significantly involved. We also have in some instances and in a gray area, institutions facilitating deals for college athletes. And states like Florida, amending its law to allow such facilitation when most, most state laws specifically prohibited uh, institutions from the facilitation of, of NIL deals. So the, the disintegration of the NCA is leading to a, a diversity of fairly logical and predictable conclusions from the institutional perspective. If your goal is to stay the most competitive, you're going to figure out a way to participate aggressively in this new market. The states push the effort, they accomplish what they set out to do, the NCAA changed its rules. There's a corresponding and much needed federal effort, but we, but we know the nature of college sports and the proverbial arms race of schools and competing for recruiting and winning games, hiring coaches, building lavish facilities. That's why states are questioning and repealing the state NIL laws that were passed. In other words, why would you restrict yourself in an arms race unnecessarily? But this isn't sustainable. Even for the top FBS schools, as Andy alluded to, and for the future of college sports and college athletes. This is why we need federal legislation that addresses NIL rights and college athletes' rights. And ideally, we need strong oversight, enforcement, and a welcoming space for innovation. If that's not going to come from the NCAA, we need to build or adapt other structures to make sure we do it right. I look forward to today's discussion. Thank you, Julie. Uh, Oliver, that's a lot of stuff already being added. Look forward to your thoughts here. Yes, well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be on the panel, uh, Donna and Dave, thank you. So we're clearly in an unprecedented era of disruption and uncertainty about college athletics, I get that. So let me put my old athletic director hat on because I think it's the ADs and their staff uh, on campus where the rubber really hits the road. It's as, as Andy ably laid out, it's a very challenging time to be an athletic director with NIL, potential state laws, collectives being created in, in your town, uh, a, a more focused 
a, a, a more focused uh, effort to, to have better mental and physical health and welfare for student athletes, the portal, and the usual problem of finances, which again, Andy laid out very well. Clearly, it seems as though there is a sort of a 10th amendment, if you will, that is being looked at uh, at the NCAA national level. Let's devolve power. Let's push power and authority down to the conferences and uh, potentially to the schools. And I'll touch on something that I don't think uh, many folks think about very often, but um, the question really is, because there is this highly regulated industry of college athletics and staff members, athletic directors across the board have been sort of conditioned uh, to follow the rules, but are the conferences capable of regulating their institutions, regulating themselves in this new environment? Clearly, I think the, the outcome of uh, the, the uh, transformation committee led by, by Julie Cromer at your school, Dave, and and Greg Sankey, the commissioner of, of the SEC, clearly uh, the NCAA will have less to do with big time sports at least. And it may be such that it's really only sort of academic eligibility uh, that the NCAA is concerned about when it comes to big time college uh, sports. So that's gonna put a lot of responsibility on these conferences. Are they prepared to pick up the slack? Again, we, we built this highly regulated industry over decades and that's how sort of the, 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 the infrastructure is, is built. And it, it's a question for me whether uh, there is enough capability, enough uh, expertise at the conference level, uh, because you certainly can't leave it to a school by school level or else this idea uh, that, that perhaps is a you know, Alice in Wonderland idea, but this idea of, of a competitive balance will completely be thrown out the window and we'll get a very sort of stratified uh, system, certainly at least in, in the, you know, the revenue sports. <clears throat> this all reminds me of, of, a, of a bit of advice that I was given when I became AD at my alma mater, West Virginia. It was given to me by Gene Corrigan, the then uh, commissioner of the Atlantic Coast Conference and a longtime you know, college sports guy. And he said, Oliver, you can, you can be involved at three levels in college athletics, your campus, your conference, and at the national level. And clearly, uh, the national level is going to lose a good bit of its authority and responsibility. We've already seen that happen uh, with, with uh, the, the recent uh, you know, legal events, both on the legislative level as well as the judicial level. Uh, so it's really going to be up to the conferences, I think, in large part, and the schools themselves. But the schools need some regulation. They, again, function in this highly regulatory um, industry, a highly regulated industry, and they, they're going to need some leadership from the conferences. And we have to see, wait and see how that, how that plays out given the, the recommendations that the Transformation Committee will make. Well, no, excellent, Oliver, great points. And, and talking about, again, boots on the ground, we're happy to have two people who have their boots on the ground and have to deal with this 24-7 uh, with what's going on. And it is easy for us in some ways to kind of be on the outside and, and talk about things, but actually being in it, really excited to hear from Jasmine and Marquita. So Jasmine, uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say about this uh, new world order, so to speak. Thank you, Dave. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as, as noted before, my name is Jasmine Ellis, and, and I'm fortunate to have a multifaceted lens working at historically Black colleges and universities, Hispanic-serving institutions, public-private, um, some in large cities, some in small cities, so my perspective really is, as Dave alluded to, it really comes from a place that considers the impact on the student athlete, impact on the, the community, as well as the administrators that work tirelessly every day in between the games, the tournaments, the marquee moments. Um, that's where my perspective lends itself when it comes to this topic. Um, I think it goes without saying how important this topic is specifically, um, again, from my preview, when we talk about the who it impacts, and which student athletes it actually impacts, which institutions these change in governance impacts. Um, and, and in some instances, as everyone has alluded to, in some decision making, it's only a certain perspective that's even considered, that's even given the latitude of open discussion. And so this conversation is pivotal uh, when it comes to looking at the marginalized groups within college athletics. Uh, the institutions that aren't at 
aren't in an arms race or creating the arms race, the institutions that's just in general admission looking at the race, um, despite the millions and billions of dollars that go through college athletics, whether it's one institution, conference sharing, even TV rights, uh, from my perspective, it, it's already a warped system when it comes to the redistribution of wealth, the redistribution of funding, who gets access to the events to get the funding, um, and, and even just institutions that are now finally getting games that are televised. People seeing their institution other than on a t-shirt or other than when their team makes a breakout run, those are the institutions that come to mind when these huge swifts and change of governance, um, as, as it's already been noted, what does that look like for the institution that doesn't have a staff of 80? What does that look like for an institution that, um, that is in a small community that, that feeds into the very things their community has access to? And so that's why this conversation really should, in, in addition to all the points made by my colleagues on the call, we should also consider when it comes to any conversation that has happened, what institutions are actually being impacted and what happens to those that aren't in that fold. Um, so things like ripple effects, conference realignments that's been mentioned on the call. Um, I know most of us look at D1, D2 ticker or, or the NACTA review, and it seems these changes are happening by the minute. Uh, when it comes to what school, what their profile is, who do they serve is, what conference alignments, and in some instances, even the footprint of a conference can impact things like misclass, student athlete well-being. And when those things aren't also addressed in the conversation, not only do you create kind of the moat that we're discussing today from a revenue perspective, um, but a fit perspective. You know, some students truly are still, some administrators truly are still geared and guided um, by charisms of a university, by charisms of a conference. And as we continue to have this conversation and, and focus it on money, opportunity, how far are we gonna get when it comes to school to school, we must understand that college athletics in general is not made up by the 130 schools in division one. All of these decisions have so many rippling effects even from an NAIA school transitioning to a division one school. What does that transition look like? What did that school have to go through to now meet the, to some of the points, the arbitrary criteria of membership? Those are the questions that I think in some instances get lost uh, because these conversations are so huge and, and they involve so much money. Um, but I still think it's pivotal that because everyone, if anything, if, if the decision has done anything when it comes to the disintegration of the NCAA, it at least has given the opportunity for more perspectives to be heard because every school's issue isn't the same. Every school isn't dealing with the same revenue issue, the same facility issue, the same transfer portal retention issue, but it is a issue. And until we have that conversation, uh, we and, and I'm not even you know speaking to a lot of them, but if, if we just economize the scale of a school that's in the power five versus school that's in the, the group of five, those are sometimes not even apples and oranges, but apples and beach balls. You know, the conversation is just completely different based on the student athletes that serve, as well as the markers that are set forth for what success means for those departments. Um, so in serving in, my, in the institutions that typically house the marginalized groups when it comes to people of color, when it comes to equality, when it comes to gender equity, um, even when it comes to just uh, the, the poverty line, what, what students' mental health needs from a socioeconomic perspective, we must in these conversations, as well as all that lead after these changes in the national governance structure, we must create a true access point for these institutions that typically are, are still trying to figure out, are we gonna keep the 10 hour bus rides? Do we have enough budget to fly? Those are true issues that these colleges, that a lot of universities are facing when it comes to participating in the arms race, but not so much participating in the arms race, but what is the next step forward? A lot of times that question starts off with, what can we afford? Um, and, and so I really wanted to make sure that in this discussion, not only do we ensure that we at least consider that everybody's situation perspective isn't the same, 
but then we also switch the conversation or add to the conversation of how can we address equity? How can we address equality? And, and these things aren't specific to race, gender, and sexual orientation. These, this same conversation can be had about mental health resources to student athletes, mental health resources to staff, coaches lose games too. Athletic administrators are disappointed too when things happen on campus. But unless we instill that into the conversation, unless at a minimum, we actually realize that every solution to a problem is not a solution to the issue, then I think we can move forward in those conversations and not just find a happy medium, but also consider that there are hundreds of athletes in this country, hundreds of athletes that come from other countries to participate in our model of college athletics. And we will be doing them as well as ourselves and injustice if we did not recognize that this conversation is so much larger than a student athlete getting an NL, a NIL deal versus a conglomerate going out and soliciting an NIL deal. But there are member institutions impacted by the release of gov governance, impacted by conferences being able to supplement NCAA legislation or, or schools amongst themselves creating it. We must consider that fact that that looks different for each conference, that looks different for the member institutions within those conference, and specifically for the student athletes that filled our teams to allow us to have these seasons over and over and over. We must consider that those are also conversations that must be had when we have this conversation as we will today. So thank you again for the time, Dave. No, uh, excellent stuff, Jasmine, and, and interesting as we segue to Marquita, someone who's worked at the Group of Five level, but also has extensive experience at the Power Five. Um, interested to hear your thoughts, Marquita. Um, again, I don't, with all the people that have gone before me, they've hit on so many other points that I, that I have prepared. But um, again, in my newly seasoned Power Five role of two weeks, so I'll give, I'll give it my best shot. But um, again, like, uh, like Dr. Redpath had said, my name is Marquita Armstead, and I'm very honored to be with you all um, today on this panel. I think um, as a person that has uh, served institutions at the FCS level, the Power Five in a different role in compliance, and then the Group of Five as a, a senior administrator, I, I don't have the perfect answer for what this industry is going to look like. It seems like every day we wake up and there's a change in the world and in this industry. Um, I've been in this, in this uh, business for 16 years, and that's not long by a stretch, but it could feel like 26 with some of the things that have changed and things like cost of attendance. And we've talked about name, image, and likeness, the transfer uh, regulations, recruiting rules, and how they've come and gone. And some have been relaxed. And then conference realignment, like Jasmine was mentioning, the D1 ticker or the D2 ticker, we see that. We get a breaking news. It seems like every afternoon of some school that has the aspiration um, to, to improve. And I think that's where a lot of this starts from is what they think is the grass is greener on the other side. And a lot of this, again, driven by the um, increasing dollars that we see in this business. I think um, in the next few years, honestly, I, as uh, Mr. Luck had said, when you see the deregulation or you're gonna see a lot of this being pushed down to conferences, I have, I have my worries about that. Can we trust the conferences and do they trust each other? I think that the trust amongst conferences and institutions are probably at the lowest point right now. And so can we trust um, each other to govern ourselves. And I think that that's going to be interesting. And then going back to, do they have the bandwidth to take on some of these issues um, locally at the institution level? The institutions, we're, we're already dealing with so much on the student athlete side, on the coaching side, and then on the, trying to stay competitive. And some of us are still very much still aimed at trying to get the best for our student athletes and for our staff. So I don't know if we could handle additionally trying to also govern ourselves. I do believe um, here, and you've heard various things, I think that uh, the, the Power Five breaking away in football is, is an interesting concept. Also, you've heard about the student athletes not even being students anymore and moving this to some type of semi-professional um, model of sports that would be associated with, with an institution which totally is against what this higher education model was supposed to be about. So I think some of those things, and those are again, worries that we have, but they're totally driven by finances, not in the best interest of the student athlete, which you very you hear um, almost rarely is what's best, like Jasmine said, for the student athletes, and especially for some of these institutions who really can't keep up. And I think that that's going to be the driver 
um, here soon. It's totally, again, going to be about what, what we can get in and what we can bring in for the bottom line. And I don't think that that's what's going to be best for any of us. I think we're hopeful, at least in the power five level and some of those conversations that we have, they're hoping for a congressional um, life raft. I don't know if that's possible either, because just with the amount of time and how slowly things move through the federal government to getting done, if that's going to be a perfect solution. And I also think that we have to be concerned about people that are not um, like we said, boots on the ground, working in this every day, telling us what to do with this industry. I would have wished that we could be more proactive instead of reactive in everything that we've done in college athletics. And I think it still can be done, but it's going to be on the president's commissioners and athletic directors in a lot of these leagues to come up with something um, that they can do to preserve somewhat this model um, and what we want and what is, which is to help our students become the best people that they can be. Oh, excellent stuff from everyone. And we're starting to get some uh, some questions from the audience. I do want to remind the audience that you can uh, use the Q&A function to uh, enter any questions that you might have. I did want to open up the panelists and see if you had any questions of each other uh, to see if there's something that piqued a, a question that you might have and, and uh, give you just a couple seconds. To, anyone can speak up. We'll have a little of some crosstalk here. And if not, we'll move on to the Q&A. Andy, go ahead. Yeah, I would just like to uh, underscore a point that uh, Marquita just made. Uh, you know, the reason why the higher education model is so important, it, it's, it's not because it's just uh, aesthetically or philosophically or ethically pleasing to talk about that model. There's a real concrete impact that it has. You know that over 98% of the, of the male basketball players and football players in the NCAA never play a single game in the NFL or the NBA. So when we talk about, we're worried about exploitation of athletes, I think the first task is to make sure that the athletes get their part of the quid pro quo when they go to college and agree to, agree to play sports. And their part of it is that they get educated. That education that they, they're supposed to get will stay with them for the rest of their lives and affects many, many, many more people than whether people are pulling down a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars in NIL income or some other income. Uh, so I, I think there's, there's really a concrete necessary reason why we need to go back to the higher education model, provide the education, also provide the health and safety benefits that these athletes are entitled to. Andy, and do, do you think that that is possible? Uh, or maybe it's not possible with the, the upper echelon of schools, but maybe some other schools can return to a potential educational model? Well, that's a Pandora's box, that question. <laughs> uh, I, I think that uh, in, insofar as we have a group of schools on the top, and whether, whether that's the, the, the 20, 25 schools that currently have a reported surplus in their athletic budget or a reduced number of schools, um, I, I think that... The, the ones who are on the top are gonna to find it more difficult to bring back the educational model. I think for everybody else, one of, one of the positive things I think that can come out of the dynamic that's currently taking place is that the chasm that has existed between the top schools and everybody else is getting deeper and deeper and wider and wider. And so I, I think there's a good chance that schools in the bottom half of, of the FBS, even in potentially the bottom half of the power five, that they're going to stop trying to emulate the people at the very top of the, of the pile. Uh, and when they do that, they can reconcentrate their, their energies and their resources on the educational model. What happens to the top 20 or 30 schools? Uh, I, I'm not sure. There's going to be increasing challenges in that regard. Well, and that goes to what you know, Jasmine uh, it was even saying. And Jasmine, you've worked, uh, of anyone in this group, primarily at lower resourced institutions. Let's, let's face it, right? And also experience it at HBCUs as an athlete and also as, a, as an administrator. Could you see something like that happening, Jasmine, that where schools that you've worked at maybe would say, we're done and we are going to really just focus on the educational and really make this an extracurricular option and just let the other schools run away and do what they want to do? Well, I appreciate that question. I, I really think most of those schools have not had the room to see what that looks like, to, to continue to try to chase after the larger schools, because if, if anyone on the call understands even identifying as low resourced or going with the budget neutral option, you recognize at the beginning that we can only go so far. We, we only have the aptitude to do so much. 
So I think what it will do, similar to what COVID did, at a minimum, it will start the conversation with what resources do we already have? Let's reach across campus. What are we already doing? Because these are full-time students at the, the foundation of any student athlete. They're always, they always go through the normal admission process. And this is my compliance hat now. They always go through the same process as every other student to get into these institutions. And so they have some fiduciary resources just based on their uh, association as a full-time student. So I think some schools have, have already had no choice but to recognize just how far their reach is. Um, but I do think a, a point that's been made is a lot of the schools that have been overreaching, they, they have been allowed to operate in a deficit. Um, the institution appreciates the, the looks that the athletics department provides. So the debt that's being added to the university is, is something that's, you know, co colloquially accepted because we, we couldn't buy this many Twitter looks, you know, with a structure. So this is why we have the staff. What I do think these schools will start to do is to embrace what they currently are good at. And, and that's an old coaching philosophy. I don't need you to be my buzzer beater, but I do need you to box out. I do need you to get some offensive rebounds. I do need you to go after those. I think from, you know, for that's very hyperbolic, but from an analogy standpoint, a lot of schools will start to recognize that we're doing very good academically. We're, we're, we're leading the conference in, in the number of students that play our most traveled sport, but also getting engineering, nursing degrees. And I think that's a byproduct because the general university is having to make those decisions as well. That they're having to reach out and do partnerships with city, with city, city public private, um, city public private relationships because the model has not been sustainable. But we still need a new facility. We still need to offer a recreational uh, facility for our general students. And and because that focus has had to shift from just the revenue conversation, a lot of that started with just about money. Now you see so many athletic departments that's not operating in silos. You see so many partnerships. You see issues like gender equity, diversity, and inclusion being the forefront of a lot of athletic-led conversations because that's what's happening on campus. That's what's happening in the community. And so I really think, you know, a, a lot of schools will have a curve uh, because, you know, the, the huge stadiums, the million dollar parking lots, the, the multiple facilities, all of those things look great online. But as we all know on the call, if you can't recruit a student and retain them, then that's costing you more money you know, then going into debt for the, the facility that you may or may not need. So I really think a lot of schools will kind of turn that conversation inward, see where their resources are the most leveraged, and then we'll start to see a, a decrease in schools trying to be the power five school that's getting millions just from the conference that they're in and really honing in on what they're good at and the ways that they can monetize the things that they actually have and not what they have to do uh, from a debt situation. Hey, hey Dave, yeah, let me, please, Oliver, go ahead. I, could. I, think, I think Andy you know, really hit the nail on the head, right? Which is, are we able to have this athletic program at all the different divisions and still fulfill the academic mission, which really is, a, is at the core of all of the institutions of higher education? Um, but, you know, but keep this in mind with those top 20, 25 schools. Last year in the 2021 NFL draft, how many players from Alabama were chosen in the seven rounds? Ten. How many players from Ohio State were chosen in the seven rounds of the 2021 draft? Ten as well. Uh, for many of those uh, top 25 schools or so that Andy referenced, uh, you know, a lot of those young men, and, and uh, this is probably true in basketball as well, given given the sort of power structure in that sport. Uh, you know, this is the pathway to their job as a professional athlete. Now, that doesn't mean you can't fulfill the academic mission. I would argue it's much harder given just the sheer volume of training and film and weight room and off-season workouts and you name it. And then you add on NIL opportunities. And, and at that level, the top 25 level, those NIL opportunities are pretty significant in terms of dollar figures. So it, it's, it's probably much more difficult at the top level to fulfill that academic mission than it would be as you move down the proverbial food chain uh, in, in the NCAA hierarchy. 
Marquita, you want to comment on that being our, our power five rep? <laughs> I think though, um, I think honestly, uh, uh, a couple of things. I think that that is true. What uh, Jasmine said and um, what Andy said, I think even at the power five level, some of those schools are going to have to reckon within themselves and figure out if, if chasing those dreams. Um, we've seen, I think I saw a stat, the, the same five teams in the CFP um, the last, since its inception, um, at least they've all been there at least once every year, at least one of those teams every year since the playoffs started. So again, even for the institutions who are spending those dollars, are those the best use of the dollars? Especially again, NIL has been a big conversation um, in my, my first couple of weeks here and how are we doing that? And if we're spending all of this money on all of these other things and that becomes something that we need to do for our students or to help if that, if that becomes the law here to help with your students, is that the best use, is the best use of your funds always the nice shiny new building or is it trying to get some of these resources and, and, and continue again with the academic resources and other things that we already provide? So I think that that, that is true, but I think some of these, uh, it's not just a, low resource institution issue, it's going to be a lot of schools that are going to have to do a gut check on whether how you're using those resources and if you're allocating them in the best way. So you might see a lot of schools stop with the arms race. Agree. And, and Julie, the elephant in the room in all of this that we haven't spoken a lot about is Title IX. That is not going to go away. So Julie, why don't you comment on that a little bit? Surely isn't. It's 50 years in and it's not going away, Dave. <laughs> So uh, it's two very distinct issues when it comes to Title IX. And of course, the conversation is, is one thing when we're just talking about name image likeness, which is here. And another thing when we open that Pandora's box, Andy referred to with regards to, oh, the employer-employee relationship and, and, and that uh, possible road and, and environment. But when it comes to Title IX, there's two, two very distinct issues. The, re the requirements for funding through mandates uh, of the law, where we create a floor and parity uh, across schools um, and gender teams opportunity and whether it's being complied with is a whole nother story. You know, we're 50 years into it and we still have about 90% of schools out of compliance with Title IX uh, and about a billion dollar shortfall in scholarship monies. Uh, you know, certainly we've made some progress in 50 years, but that is far from compliance with the law. And then aside from the mandates of Title IX, you have the money that flows purely through the marketplace. So uh, you know, as, as Justice Kavanaugh referred to uh, the NCA as a cartel and his, uh, uh, his uh, presenting opinion uh, in the Alston case, um, it's, an, it's an anachronistic model and, and outmoded. And it's, um, you know, uh, it's, it's not a helpful uh, observation if we don't fill that void with federal legislation and some kind of structure. Like I said, that schools are acting logically and predicting it in the moment with Alabama repealing their law, but it's only going to consolidate, you know, more wealth, more power in the moment, um, because that's that's what they can do right now, you know, in this vacuum of of authority. So again, that's the failure of the NCA. If, if these dues-paying member institutions um, paid the NCA to be a, a traffic cop, the NCA has essentially walked away from the intersection at this point, and they didn't even leave a blinking light for anyone. So everyone's uh, you know, doing what they can in the moment while they can. While they can. So it's a, you know, it's a dereliction of duty um, and it's gonna cause more lawsuits. You know, that's, that's, where we, that's what's got us here. And in this environment, it will only create more without some type of, of uniformity. So um, you know, I, I just add that there's more questions than answers right now. I think we're all throwing it out there, but these questions are critical. They're critical to ask right now, they're critical to address. And the more likely that we do that, the more likely that we'll, you know, do the right thing. And I think um, one question specifically with Title IX is the law is intended to apply to educational institutions and students being students, not employees. Um, but it is silent technically, uh, specifically on, on compensation. So how do you treat that? The law, Title IX, is not silent on, on treatment, benefits, and financial aid. So how will that translate? Um, you know, I, I would be exceedingly nervous to uh, say we can guarantee women, um, we're talking about the compensation model and employees, uh, the same as men based on a 50 year old law that's silent specifically on that. So um, it, it's important that we get these right, that um, there needs to be, uh, you know, is it amending Title IX? Is it spelling it out explicitly in a new statute um, to address equity and make sure women are, are similarly supported and compensated? Um, and there needs to be some sort of explicit acknowledgement that the changes in the landscape 
um, need to be consistent with any new statute, not some outmoded, you know, strict uh, constructionist interpretation that may work um, to even further undermine women. So it's another reason why we need to get in front of it. There are potential vulnerabilities and um, it's a wide open policy landscape. So, you know, that's the upside. It's, it's an exciting, it's, you know, we look at it as an exciting time because we have an opportunity to do it. We have an opportunity to do it right. And um, I truly believe that if we waste this opportunity and we establish precedent that effectively overrides any type of federal action where federal legislators may get some cold feet because they feel they have something better back home with their, their state law, then we're in that race to the bottom. It's not the answer. And there's only gonna be more lawsuits if we go down that path. I think you're right. And I, um, before we move into the questions from the audience, and I see we have several, I do want to, with all due respect to myself and everybody else on the panel, I want to focus on those of you that have been college athletes, Julie, Oliver, and Jasmine. And Julie, we'll start with you. How would you, from an athletic perspective, if you were competing now, what would your perspective be of this whole thing? Because oftentimes I think we tend to, I talk to my own athletes here at Ohio University, they're really not aware of what's going on. They, they're just kind of, going with the flow, so to speak. How would you feel as an athlete? I would feel um, excited about the opportunities that have opened up, um, but, but nervous as to, you know, what, what's going to happen the very next year or, you know, for, for my niece, that's a swimmer who, who's good enough, or at least she's going to be swimming in college. You know, I'm, I'm concerned about the future of college sports. Um, it's, uh, you know, we, to go down the road of the, the consolidation of power, um, with the wealthiest schools and, and have what, what Andy mentioned in terms of, um, you know, exploring other types of, of revenue in terms of, uh, betting organizations, um, you know, reducing opportunities, increasing student fees. I don't believe it's sustainable. That concerns me. And I think we're doing a disservice to college athletes and, and college athletics if we don't, you know, take these issues seriously now and, and get in front of them. And Oliver, not only were you a, a premier college athlete, you also had children who were premier college athletes. How, as a parent, as a former athlete yourself, how would you absorb all of this? How would your kids absorb all of this as college athletes? Yeah, to me, there's one word that uh, has applied, you know, back in the 60s or 70s or 80s and, and is applicable today as well, and that is balance, right? It's hard being a college athlete. I don't care what level you're participating at, what sport. Uh, it's, it's challenging. Your, your time is, is precious. Uh, there's been a new element added, which is, oh, I can go out and do some NIL deals and, you know, make a thousand bucks or 10,000 bucks or whatever it is. It's all has to be put into balance. And ultimately, the most important thing, uh, I, I felt this as a student athlete, I told this to my kids who played uh, in, in college and as well as you know, my charges, if you will, at WVU when I was athletic director, the most important thing is academics. Uh, Andy's absolutely right. Very few people have a chance to make real money as professionals. So it's about balance and that hasn't changed. And uh, it's, it's tough because a lot of kids come out of uh, environments where they haven't really been able to sort of create that balanced uh, approach to life. But um, I, I don't share Julie's pessimism about the model uh, of college athletics. I, I think it's got incredibly strong roots and huge equity across the country. And I think one of the reasons it does is that parents are tripping over themselves to get their kids college scholarships, right? They're taking club sports, they're doing high school sports, they're doing travel teams, they're spending tens of thousands of dollars on private coaches. Why? To get their kid a scholarship to uh, State University XYZ to play sport ABC. And that, that won't change. People are competitive in this country. And I think because of that, you're seeing uh, just a, a, an incredible growth, honestly, in, in college sports and the dollars that are being generated. Excellent. And Jasmine, to you, again, uh, just to be to be kind, you were a college athlete a lot more recent than <laughs> others on the panel, right? So uh, how about your perspective with, with what's going on and how would you be as an athlete with all this going on around you? Dave, my knees would beg to differ. I, I feel that I played multiple years of, of sports, college athletics specifically, 
Um, I, I think to the points, you know, that have been made when I was a college athlete, it was still taboo to think about transferring, you know, that conversation you didn't have in the locker room, you were hesitant to have it with your family because it seemed as if you weren't grateful for your current opportunity. Um, and so if I were a student athlete of today, uh, one, I would have a substantial amount more even information just on that the, the process. I can go and look up the manual myself. It, it, I can walk into the compliance office and ask that question instead of, hey, you transferred that one time. What was it like? So I think right now um, as a student athlete, um, especially in the world of, of NILs, I would one want to know what that means. And a lot of student athletes, um, even those that are not in, informed on everything, they are so much more educated. They ask so many more questions. They, they really want to be a part of the decision making. And so now I would take advantage of that. If it was ever a time that a student athlete could ask a question and expect the answer, because students, the first thing they do is go and look up what you told them to make sure that it's accurate. I would ask that question. I, I, would, I would absolutely see, hey, coach, what does this look like? Hey, compliance administrator, what does this look like? Um, but again, this conversation, even just the privilege of, of saying I, I want to go to another place, it's very isolated to a, a type of college athlete, to a, a college athlete that's highly recruited, that their best games are always televised, that their stats are on a ticker. It's, it's so many college athletes um, that are in the portal that either lose their opportunity at their current school, are not as highly recruited as they thought they would be because they made player of the week that one time. And so unfortunately, that's why I agree with, we can return to the model of college athletics, the reward being a degree. Because if there was ever a time to have a credential, if there was ever a time that education does create additional opportunity, even being in a classroom with someone that starts a great business, they can employ you. And if depending on the industry, both of you could be extremely rich with the two years of school that you went to. And so I really think if I was a college athlete now, the information is different, so I would know more, but I would also be able with the internet to see that just because the student enters the portal does not mean that they'll be placed. Just because the student enters the portal doesn't mean that they can stay at the current place because aid agreements are still in, in a lot of cases for that year, for their one academic year. And so I would really just be able to not only weigh what my options are, but it's so many resources that I can go out and, and really make an informed decision that when I truly was in this position as a college athlete, just the information wasn't available, let alone the actual opportunities to do something else. So I really think right now, student athletes, coaches, administrators, this is the best time to embrace collaboration. This is the best time to embrace that you know the the mystique of college athletics has been unveiled so it's, it's not a big secret anymore you can go out you can source that information um, but I absolutely would take advantage of being able to ask those questions leverage my opportunity um, and 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 I'm a southerner and my mother would make sure that if this is the place that's going to give you a degree that you've earned it you have roots here you're a part of that community then those things are, are the things that will capitulate your career far before you transferring to another school and getting six more minutes on the court. Um, and so I think that that's a very different onset from when I previously was a, a student athlete to the options that I have now. Oh, excellent stuff. Uh, Oliver, you want to comment on that? I, I just wanted to say one thing. You know, the, the, the other way of looking at all of this, I think all of us would, would agree that student athletes over the last couple, three, four, five, ten years, whatever, have been empowered and that that's a good thing i think we all agree uh so that's you know nil the portal you name it but you know with those new rights come additional responsibilities and that's putting a lot on these young people but guess what we're not going backwards this is going to be the the core of the future moving forward and that that's all about educating those young people about the rights that they have and also the responsibilities going into the portal is it's a big decision that, that a young person would make. And guess what? There are kids who aren't coming out the other side with scholarships. But, you know, that's with those rights come additional responsibilities. And I think that's one way to one lens to look through to, to sort of look at what's what's going on currently. 
I absolutely agree. Uh, have several questions from the audience with about the, the 30 or so minutes we have left. So I do want to get to those and I'll just kind of try to direct traffic here. We have a question from Sandy Thatcher. Uh, he's asking about what about um, the financial structure? We'll start with Andy. Uh, the financial structure of college athletics will likely result in the reduction of support for non-revenue producing Olympic sports, which has been the main source, as we know, of Olympians for the U.S. Should Congress consider the model that other countries follow of supporting national teams through national financing? Um. It, uh, maybe um, we're, we're the only we're the only country that participates in the Olympics that doesn't have federal direct federal financing for developing the Olympic teams. Uh, I think as insofar as this applies to college, first of all, Sandy's observation is probably correct. There's going to be increasing pressure to cut some of the the non revenue sports slash Olympic sports. Uh, I have to say, however, that I, I look at this not as a problem with our generating Olympic teams. Um, but rather providing the student athletes with an athletic experience. The athletic experience, whether it's at Division One, Two, or Three, that athletes have is very, by and large, is very beneficial for them. Um, number one, they, they balance a, a sedentary cerebral existence as a student with physical activity. That's good. Number two, they learn team, teamwork. Number three, they, they learn commitment and time, uh, time management. Uh, they learn all sorts of other skills. And we know from a variety of studies that when they're student athletes, they're more likely to take care of themselves in a variety of ways, emotionally and physically. So that, that's what I want to preserve. I, I don't care as much about whether we, you know, we win six, six gold medals or five gold medals at, at the next, next Olympic Games. We should be focused on what it's going to do to the, the benefits and the values that adhere to student athletes from playing uh, intercollegiate athletics. Anyone else would like to comment on that on that uh, question? I'll dovetail on that with um, and uh, just to make sure Oliver knows I'm not a pessimist. <laughs> 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 I, uh, forever an optimist, and that's why I want to try and emphasize us getting in front of in front of the issues because there's there's uh, there's a lot to be concerned about, and I think. Um, that, you know, we need to think about the athletes uh, whose families um, don't just have the means to, to hire the coaches and, and not, as Andy referenced, uh, you know, training to make an Olympic team, um, uh, you know, and those that may have that the only means to get to college uh, through, through an athletic scholarship and be able to afford it, uh, whether it's partial or full. And um, without those types of opportunities and in non-revenue sports, um, you know, that, that's part of leveling the playing field. So we don't make these existing disparities um, in access and wealth um, even, even wider, even worse among athletes and institutions. Anyone else? I, I, would, I would think just on, on the Olympics piece, um, you know, the, the Olympics obviously is something that, uh, you know, all Americans who care about sports should, should uh, take some pride in and the success that we've had. I think this NIL universe should help uh, the collegiate programs keep uh, their Olympians, right? You know, Katie Ledecky doesn't need to leave Stanford to go train full time so that she can you know, make some NIL money, right? She can stay at Stanford, compete collegiately, win a bunch of NCAA championships as she has, but also generate you know, whatever revenue she's able to generate. So at least theoretically, as you think about it, uh, whether it's uh, you know, track and field or swimming or any of the other uh, Olympic sports, mostly in the summer, not so much in the winter, uh, but I, I, I think that NIL should keep a lot of those potential collegiate, uh, potential Olympians on, on, on collegiate campuses. No, I, th I think you're, you're right. And kind of a next question from Sandy, and I'll start with Marquita. Um, how likely is it, do you think, that some colleges might actually change varsity teams to club sports, something that we've seen at Stanford and other schools the past few months? I don't know, again, how likely it is. I think, again, it's, as we've talked about some of these models that are picking up interest or steam, and uh, like Julie said, without regard for Title IX, which I think is a big issue when you start talking about reduction of sports, male or female, um, depending on your institution. But I do think that there is going to be some kind of concerted effort to separate in some way the football and basketball piece that goes with this. Um, and, and even with the when we talk about the university splitting off, it's, it's driven 
by the football and basketball model. So I think that there's real interest in trying to do that. There are constraints right now. But again, like we said, some of these things like Title IX are not going away. So I think that people need to think about that in, in making that decision, like you still could be bound by that. But I think that you will see if, the, if given the chance, and again, if given the opportunity to make uh, more money that you would see that there would be some kind of structure where you would see a lot of these Olympic sports going away, unfortunately. Anyone else would like to comment on that? The chances of uh, sports becoming club at all? Oh, Julie, you have a comment? Nope, no problem. I can move on to the next question from, uh, oh, Julie, did you have a comment? Okay, I'll move on to Chris Voltz has a question and he's very concerned about uh, the concerns of Jasmine. And basically what he's asking, and this would be for, we'll start with you, Jasmine, but we'll work around to everybody. I think it's a great question. What are the practical next steps? Who is going to orchestrate the strategic plan or is that going on right now with this transformation committee? Um, you know, how will intercollegiate athletics sustain itself over the next decade? We'll start with you, Jasmine. Dave, I think if I had that answer, I probably wouldn't be on this panel. I would be somewhere <laughs> reprinting and reproducing books, movies, and webinars. Um, <laughs> but I mean, you know, that's such a huge question. It's such a loaded question um, because the 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 downside of of kind of the issue that we're we're all trying to adjust or speak to um, just has so many parts that we don't control. Uh, one of those things being right now, college athletics probably has, you know, a, a lot of taboos, but it's the most accepted. It's, it, it's no other industry. I'm, and I'm, I'm sure people are now Googling as I'm saying it, but it's, it's probably, whoa, minimal. <laughs> I have those lights in my office too. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> that. I didn't even recognize I was sitting. Hold on one second. <laughs> yeah. Those, mo those motion lights are, are pretty interesting. Yeah. You got you to move your hand on occasion, I guess. There we go. We're conserving energy at the University of Akron. That's a great <laughs> plug for my institution. Um, but, but as I was saying, the, the downside of that is um, that you really don't control a lot of the, the issues or the inputs that make this such a loaded conversation. Uh, so I think the next, next steps are what we're doing. Get the people in the, in the room that are dealing from a legislative perspective, perspective dealing from a campus perspective, dealing from a, a professional perspective, um, because that's something that's rarely talked about because we have the club of amateurism is how much of a feeder system college athletics is to those next levels. And not just the NBAs, the NFLs, but there are a myriad of professional opportunities. And, and when you speak in regards of Title IX for male athletes and, and a few for female athletes, that depend on the very operation of a college athletic department. And so but before we're able to even start answering that question, we must at a minimum recognize what's a college athletic issue and what's the issue based on who we do business with. And I think once we're able to separate those two conversations, then we can truly focus on what the next steps are from a, a college intercollegiate perspective and not who, you know, who are we helping? Who's helping us? Are we leveraging a partnership? Because that's what kind of muddies the water. It, it's not the sanctity of, of college athletics, getting recruited, going to a school, potentially getting some aid, and then four to six years later, you have a degree. It's all the things that happen in between that time or, or what you think you can go to or you can stop school and, and get this other opportunity. Those are the conversations that muddy the water. They kind of, you know, downplay the award of a degree because there's still a substantial amount of people in our country, in our very smart, powerful country that don't have access to higher education. And, and it's universities multiple that's down the street from them online educations and just the, the access to that is still very much so far away. Um, so I don't have the answer. Hopefully we come up with it on this call, but there's some <laughs> fundamental conversations we must have before we can start to approach what's the next steps because there's so many instances that, that contribute to our current issue. You had some good suggestions. I mean, Oliver, you've been on all sides of this uh, from the professional side, which relied on college uh, colleges and universities and being on the inside. Um, what are those next steps? How does the strategic plan go? Who, who are the stakeholders that need to be involved? 
Well, yeah, the, the, the transformation committee is going to take the lead. Uh, that's, you know, sort of the system that, that is in place and that won't change, uh, you know, very quickly, if you will. Uh, I do think that if, if the folks on that committee are honest with themselves, they will look at division one, all 350 some schools and, you know, say to themselves, wow, there is not a lot of commonality in the four or five or six or seven different categories of those schools in, in division one. They may redefine what it means to be a division one school. You may have to have uh, the, a certain number of sports and, and all those sports may need to be full scholarship, no more partials. Why should we you know, disadvantage a, 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 I don't know, a softball player or track and field athlete versus a football player? What, what sort of value uh, you know, to, to conversation needs to happen with that? So uh, there could be financial issues, uh, you know, budgets. I mean, there's all sorts of criteria that one could imagine. Uh, but I think if, if, the, if the group is sort of, you know, brutally honest with itself, it'll, it'll come to the conclusion that there are, uh, you know, a, a lot of different slices, if you will, or tiers of schools in Division I. And, and there may be some of those tiers uh, that move, you know, a step or two away from the NCAA's governance structure. Enforcement, Dave, and you know a lot about this mm -hmm. uh, based on uh, your, your past uh, with, with the association. Enforcement may uh, play a much more minor role uh, with some of those tiers, if you will. They may outsource that. Uh, the college football playoff, which uh, is, is an LLC unrelated to the NCAA, uh, the CFP may decide it, it's going to run uh, the regular season and the playoffs for you know, big time college football, wherever that cut point may be. So I, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't think any one of us uh, does, uh, but, but I, I do think that the discussion, uh, certainly about division one will, will really begin in earnest and in, in, very, in a very fulsome manner when the transformation committee says, hey, here's our recommendations. Yeah, and Andy, you're at a division three school. What are your thoughts on how can this be done? Well, let me come back to Division Three later, but pick up on something that, that Oliver said, which is that, to be sure, there are a lot of different characteristics within Division One right now. And, and if, if the transition committee is honest with itself, they'll recognize that. And what I was alluding to earlier will, will transpire, which is that there'll be a, a group of 20 or 30 schools at the top that break off. And as they break off, they will have to deal with different different suits and processes that are underway right now that seek to declare athletes to be employees. And once they do that, then the schools are going to be up against paying social security taxes, up against paying workman's compensation, up against paying, paying unemployment compensation. Uh, the, the athletes themselves will, will be paying income taxes. The IRS will take another look at different UBIT rules that have benefited the universities enormously, the, the athletic programs in the universities. There's going to be a lot of other changes, uh, and and the Drake Group, as you know, Dave has has for a couple of years now been supporting legislative efforts, and there have been a few, and there's another one on the way now. Legislative efforts for the Congress to commission a two, perhaps uh, shorter or longer, roughly a two-year study to look at the entirety of college sports, ask questions like, what do we want our college sports system to be doing? What do we want our colleges to be doing? The U.S. Congress and the U.S. government is already very involved in, in the um, activity of higher education. There are about $200 billion a year in budget money that, that go, go to U.S. colleges, $30 billion of Pell Grant money every year, many of which goes to college athletes. They're already involved. Back in the 1970s, the Congress had a three-year commission uh, to, to study our Olympic system. It was controlled in the old days by all the uh, Amateur Athletic Union. It, after that study was done, it was reorganized under the USOC, now the USOPC. We think that all of these elements that are changing are all interrelated with each other, and there needs to be a coherent package of reform. It's not going to happen at a decentralized level. I, 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 in, in spite of the skeptical remarks I made earlier about the US Congress, I think we're dependent on them now. I think they're the ones that have to impose some structure and, and, and some meaningful process uh, to, to show us the way forward. I think yeah, you're likely correct. Marquita, where, where do you think this is going? Do you think the Transformation Committee can get it done, or is it going to have to be from the outside? 
I would be hopeful that they can get it done, but I think, like I said in some of my opening comments, I think there are a lot of people that are depending on Congress now to come in and fix it because it's, again, it's a it's such a large issue, problem, or mess. However, you want to look at it that we that we have now to 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 get right. So, um, I I think that there's some very very smart people, people smarter than I, on that committee that that can you know push for some change. But I think that like. Uh, Oliver and Andy said they got to be honest with themselves and that that may ca cause some hard conversations to be had. And uh, but I would be hopeful that they could do it. Well, our next question I wanted to go well, goes to Julie and it's direct. It's, it's pretty direct. Do you foresee any federal legislation in the future to regulate not only college, high school and uh, college NIL deals, but also high schools or maybe even go back, put, try to put the genie back in the bottle uh, with NILs. I, I think that that's probably unlikely. I think I know what your answer is going to be, but where do you think federal legislation is going with NILs? And certainly we've talked about a potential congressional commission to study college athletics. Will Congress make this move? That's a really another question. I, I, uh, I am very optimistic they will. Uh, I think the question is when. I think there's there's progress that's being made. There was some progress last year. And, and again, I think it was hard for them to act without knowing exactly what would be happening and how it would play out. Now that these things are playing out, we have these, um, you know, all of the states uh, moving in, uh, in, terms of, in terms of passing their own laws and now repealing, but the institutions creating their own uh, you know, sophisticated consortiums to support their, their institutions. They exist, exist solely for each institution and act solely on behalf of that institution. So the, there's a lot of interesting questions that, that come into play with that. And um, in terms of, you know, are these essentially surrogates of, institution, of the institution and are they subject to um, federal laws such as, I'll keep with my theme of the day, Title IX. <laughs> and so... Um, you know, it, it can't be emphasized enough when, when the institution is involved, there, there must be equal effort uh, in, for publicity exposure and efforts at marketing. And, and um, so, uh, you know, and now we have facilitating in the state of Florida and um, perhaps other places. So we're, we're squarely in this wild west um, and how to um, determine these issues is yet to be decided. And, and I agree with Andy, it's, it's, it's in Congress's uh, court now the ball is in their court hopefully and we can um, get get some some progress there um, so it, it's a good question I don't know if it's going to happen this year I, I certainly hope it does um, because with the discussions of things like employment um, and some of the proposals include that at the federal level as well on uh, organizing and, and possible collective bargaining agreements that um, you know it needs to be addressed at the federal level rather than as uh, Jasmine noted, the, the decentralization and letting the, the schools and um, conferences um, basically, you know, take over. Uh, Oliver, it's, it's no secret that you are part of a NIL collective, a Country Roads Trust at, at West Virginia University, your alma mater. How are you handling some of these issues regarding NILs? And do you, do you feel that there'll be federal legislation uh, to help regulate or even perhaps negotiating directly with the athletes to talk about potential NIL restrictions? So uh, I, I, I don't know if there'll be congressional legislation. I mean, it's, it's, it would be welcomed, you know, but of course, you know, it depends on the spectrum of, of what you want from that legislation and, and how it would be implemented. Uh, and, and my crystal ball there is very, you know, very fuzzy. Um, I, I help with a couple of other uh, uh, fairly well-off alumni to put together a uh, collective or a trust uh, to support NIL opportunities for my alma mater, West Virginia, doesn't have a state law, so there were really no restrictions there. And I think as everybody on this panel knows and, and everybody listening as well or watching, uh, the NCAA has quite honestly been very silent on uh, a lot of this, I, I think, uh, Julie, did you use the uh, the analogy of the policeman just walking off, the traffic cop walking off the, 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 the square or something and letting traffic just uh, handle itself? So that's the situation we're in. Uh, lots of uh, communities, right, without necessarily direction from their uh, institution have set up these, uh, these collectives. Uh, Julie, you're a UT grad like I am from law school, and they've got four different trusts or collectives, one uh, taking care of just the baseball players, one taking care of just a certain position on the football team, tight ends, 
uh, one taking care of offensive linemen and one that uh, is much more sort of broadly focused on, on uh, the athletes at the University of Texas. So, uh, you know, some, le- some regulation will come into this space at some point. Uh, but right now, as, as you know, as, as been, has been said, there, there really isn't much. It's a vacuum. Uh, some states have state laws. Some of those states law, state laws are being amended. Uh, and I would think that that trend, beginning with Alabama, that totally repealed its NIL law and then following up with Florida that's amended it, uh, I think you'll see that states don't want to restrict uh, their beloved flagship universities and others because, you know, there's a massive amount of pride and satisfaction when a uh, state university flagship school XYZ wins a championship or wins a title. Absolutely. And moving on to our, our next question from Mike Seeley, they're, they're gambling oriented, the new world of sports betting. Uh, start with Andy. Do you feel that athletic departments are going to be under stronger pressures as our professional teams to align with sports betting because it could be such a prominent revenue source? Yes, I said that actually in my initial <laughs> remarks. Uh, I do think there's going to be a lot of pressure to do that. And I'm scared to Dickens at what's going to happen. And it, you know, it's, it's one thing when you introduce sports betting at the professional sports level or professional sports athletes are very well compensated, or at least the vast majority of them are. And I think hence they're, they're pretty immune to being, to taking bribes about altering a game. College athletes are not well compensated. Uh, maybe with the exception of a handful now that are, are getting as Nick Saban told us, his quarterback is getting a million dollars in NIL money. But um, I think that, that their targets here uh, and the referees and, and, and umpires in the games of college sports, their targets too. Uh, and I, I, th- I think that, uh, you know, ha- having just as happening now in the professional stadiums and arenas, you, you've got sports betting parlors. Are we going to see them in college sports stadiums? Just the way that we're, we're now seeing the sale of alcohol in college sports stadiums. There's a, there's a very slippery slope that this can all go down, and um, it scares the heck out of me. I, I'm not sure how it's going to be regulated short of Congress. Any other comments from the panelists on gambling? Oliver? I, I respect Andy's position on, on this, uh, but I also you know, ask myself, my gosh, there's been bookies for the last 50, 60 years uh, taking bets on college games uh, all across the country. So one of the arguments, I don't know if it's a good one or not, Andy, uh, I'd, I'd be curious on your response, but one of the arguments is, you know, bring the sports gambling, the illegal sports gambling out of the shadows, uh, just like it's been done in Europe with, you know, first division soccer, second, third, fourth division soccer, use AI and all the data uh, to determine if there is a game that's being thrown it's happened in the past in, in, in college, of course, if you think about, you know, some of those scandals, uh, rarely, but this happened in the past. Uh, is there a better way to regulate it, I suppose, and, and keep the, the, the student athletes sort of out of, you know, harm's way in terms of being, uh, you know, being bribed, if you will, to, to throw a game? I, I don't know the answer, but I, I do know for, for a fact that, uh, you know, sports gambling on, on college games has been happening for, for decades. Right. No, and, that, and that's a great point. Go ahead, Andy. Well, just very briefly, it, it's interesting to note, since you brought up European soccer, that there, there, there has been a freedom in, in Europe for a long time to bet on soccer games. They have now taken a position that it's gone too far and it's not being regulated properly. And sure, if we could put everything out in, in the sunshine and we could have uh, efficient and effective regulatory bodies, then maybe, maybe this wouldn't be a problem. But the, the problem that I see, Oliver, is that we don't have those bodies and that there's going to be an enormous expansion in the activity around college sports, college sports betting for professional sports. People are going to watch games increasingly because they're making prop bets. So what's going to happen on the next play? Is that the way we want our, our fans and our students and our communities to be relating to college sports? I just think there's, there's a lot there that we haven't figured out and it's scary. Yeah, and we are getting short on time, so I'm going to do a bit of a lightning round here, and I do want to let the audience know that your questions are going to be answered uh, on our follow-up, and and there's so many good questions, and again, I knew that we would have a tough time getting to all of these uh, questions. I hope a lot of your things have been answered, but I'm going to ask a question from our president, Donna Lopiano, which I really like. We'll start with Jasmine. Um, What is the minimum that has to be done to prioritize graduation? as a desirable outcome. After all, this is still supposed to be about education. 
Well, I, I think what, what we see on a very minimal basis is uh, that the, the other options, so professional, starting your own business, you see these athletes 20 years later going back to get their degree. You see some athletes that promote, hey, I'm on a bus, but I'm doing a discussion board and I'm running through the tunnel. I really think we'll just have to transition the connotation of college sports while it, it does serve as a revenue source we must get back to those conversations of this is for life preparedness. You, you know, your, your life expectancy on a professional level in some instances are two years. It's, it's 37 months, 42 months, but a college degree, a certification, a degree in this specific industry, that's what will hold you steadfast for 40 years. And, and again, with the student athletes, that are so educated, the student athletes that are receptive to accurate, transparent communication. I think once you present that in a way that, that doesn't come off as a mandate, you must do this to be successful, you use it as an option. This is a highly turn on your investment for four years. If you stay the course, get your degree. It's a, it's a few athletes that stay in school that could have left and gone to professional, but they made the decision from a family perspective, from a, I'm a starting guard in college, but I'll be a practice player in the pros, I should get my degree. And so I think the connotation has to transition. Um, as, it, as it's been said on the call right now, the money is, is the forefront of that conversation. And unfortunately, we see a lot of our, our student athletes that's going to these huge institutions they come from backgrounds that are low income. They come from backgrounds that they're the first and only in a lineage of, of generations to even step foot on a college campus. And so we need to change the connotation of this just being a platform for you to play sports and get to the next level, that this is a platform for you to gain educationally. That is the pros. It's a 100% return on investment if you get this degree and go out and now you're a viable candidate for a job. Whereas you look at from an athletic standpoint, it's looking like 1%. And I think that's the current percentage of, of student athletes that's represented that go to a four-year school and then go professional. I know it's not over three. And so if you lay that out in a PowerPoint, in a TikTok, in something that's colors with music, students will definitely understand that the educational model and, and the foundations of it is the, the, the option that you can quote unquote bet on because it has so many more options as opposed to putting all of your efforts into becoming a professional athlete. And I really think that'll help us if we, if we change the tone and the connotation. No, I agree. And Marquita, just, uh, you know, same question, what has to be done to prioritize? Would it be things like mandated five-year scholarships, restoring the NCAA certification process? What, what do you think needs to be those things to say, this is what it's about, and this is what will increase graduation rates? I, I think um, that that's true, but I think there also needs, um, like Mr. Luck said, there needs to be, there are some students who, who are going to reach the, the professional leagues and they are going to come through the system as it is now, or, or that's how we hope for it to continue to be. There needs to be a way to separate the two. So there are going to be some students, and I know we didn't even delve into, does the, do the professional leagues owe anything to help with this problem and they kind of get away they don't get any of the backlash that the colleges get. And we, again, there's there's various reasons for that, but pressing on how to make a way for some of those students who they want to be professionals and they want to have a chance to do that. But then there are a lot more students who, like Jasmine said, they want to come. They're the first, they're the first in their family to get an education. They are coming. They know that that you know being a professional athlete might not be in the future. They might come with aspirations of that, but they realize somewhere down the path and that they can get a meaningful degree because a lot of times, and I don't Dr. Redpath, this is one of your pet peeves. They are put into some of these majors where it's about eligibility and staying eligible, and that's it, but where they could have some time to really find out what they want to do post um athletic participation and go into fields and get meaningful degrees. So I think that there needs to be a way that we can help, if, if it is even for us to still help both sets of, uh, of right now they're student athletes, but those those prospects that do, they want to, you know, put something into trying to make a run at being a professional athlete, but also to still service the students who really come here for that higher education model, that we need to figure out how to do that. 
Well, thanks so much. Unfortunately, we, we have to end. There's so much more I wanted to ask, so many more questions from the audience that we are going to get to. But again, I want to thank our panel. This was fantastic. There was some great insight. I felt like I earned a doctorate in college athletics uh, just listening to you. Uh, so I really, really appreciate it. Again, to the audience, we will get to your questions and apologize we couldn't get to them all. Again, thank you, panelists. I'm giving you a uh, applause from, uh, from me. Uh, thanks again, and thank you to everyone for joining again this Drake webinar. We will have another one in April and more news to follow up on that soon. Thank you again.